I'd like you to take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the book of Acts, the first chapter, and we're going to read one verse in just a moment from Acts chapter 1. In just a few weeks, we have our World Mission Conference. I want you to have an understanding of that, and I want you to write down the things I'm sharing with you today from God's word. And I want you to be able to repeat these things to someone near you in just a little bit. As we break up for prayer in 10 different regions of America, we're praying for. So have all that before you. You remember when we deal with the Great Commission, we say it's given in five parts. Not five times, but five parts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts. Once in each of the gospel records. And these parts were given to us either on the day of the resurrection of Jesus or on the day of his ascension or during the 40 days he spent with his disciples. And so we have the part from Matthew chapter 28 that tells us that Christ will go with us everywhere we go. In Mark chapter 16, the part that reveals to us that when we give the gospel, miraculous things take place. The part in Luke chapter 24 that reveals to us that we are witnesses, and I want you to know this, the noun comes before the verb. We do what we do because we are who we are, and we are witnesses. Jesus said, the Lord Jesus said, you are witnesses of these things. We are witnesses, therefore we witness, and we are endued with power from on high. In John chapter 20, we have the part that reveals to us that we are sent by his authority. As the Father sent me, even so send I you. So we have the authority there. There are four gospel records, one gospel, four gospel records. The gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to John. Then we come to the book of Acts in chapter 1 and verse 8 to the fifth part. When you put all five parts together, you get the whole and the understanding of it. In this fifth part, the Lord explains to us that there's no place to stop. I said years ago to our Christian school people, years ago, I said the principal may know why we have a Christian school. But I want to meet a child in the hallway that can tell me why we have a Christian school. So this whole idea of Christian education should permeate the entire school, the student body, parents, teachers, students. They all understand why we're doing this. When it comes to world evangelism and the mission God has given us, and we use this as mission singular, that's very important. It is a mission conference because his mission in the world we're getting in on. It's his mission and we're getting in on his mission. He's already doing that, and we're getting in on it. But I don't want to just meet the pastor or someone on a church staff who understands this mission endeavor, this mission initiative, this mission conference. I'd like to think that we could meet a junior high school girl or boy in a church, and they could tell us, this is why we're doing what we're doing. So certainly all of you ought to get it, and I want you to understand that. The mission conference is not our mission work. It is a recognition and if you would, in some people's thinking, a celebration of what we're doing. It's sort of like a birthday, as I've said to you. Don't mind repeating that. The birthday is not your life. It's a recognition that you're alive and an opportunity to show appreciation for you. And so the mission conference is for emphasis. Now we come to the fifth part of the Great Commission given by the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, none of it given before his resurrection. Here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, I have written extensively on this particular subject. 
Most of what I'm saying to you is in print. It's been passed down the line to lots of people. But I want you to write it down. If we're going to do God's work God's way, we must do it the Bible way, right? We are praying for a revolution back to the Bible. There are many desperate people today who think they need to get it right, and to get it right means to invent something new. They're like all the Athenians and strangers who came in Athens to hear some new thing on Mars Hill. And Paul declared to them the unknown God, unknown to them, but the God of heaven and earth. Now, what's the real issue in the world? The real issue has to do with God's people. The Lord is always working through a remnant. Always. We're not trying to imagine that our goal is to get every human being converted to Christ. It's not going to happen. Even the work of world evangelism Let's imagine you have a people group. A people group. It's not our responsibility to evangelize another people group, but we are responsible to reach people in that people group who evangelize their own people group. The principle works also in something like the University of Tennessee. If we go down there and there are 26,000 students, we're trying to give the gospel to all those students. The fact of the matter is we need to reach people in that student body, train them, They've been reached with the gospel. Their lives have been changed. And then they set out to be a Christian witness on their campus. Understand how it works? One member of a family that's a Christian can try to win all the members of the family. So we're working at it that way. Now, let's write a few things down. We must have a biblical beginning. A biblical beginning. We begin in prayer, waiting on God, praying. I'm going to come to a final thing in a moment, but the final thing is the thing that most people want to put first, but it should be the final thing. The Lord is working on us so he can work through us. I've said often, and this is a quote you should remember, the greatest work God does for us is in our heart. The greatest work we do for God is in our home. So the Lord works on us so that we can work for him. That's why work should come out of worship. And the Lord taught his disciples to pray, instructed them, and we notice as we read the book of Acts, they began in a prayer meeting, waiting on the Lord. Our prayer life is our Christian life. You can't live the Christian life without God. You can't contact God without prayer. And so we're praying by faith, believing. And so we begin in prayer. We must have a biblical beginning. Notice again, if you would please, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Who's doing this? The Lord Jesus is giving this. I want you to write a second thing down and you'll share this with someone else. We must have biblical authority. What right do you have to go to some other place and intrude in the culture? The cultural anthropologist will say, why do you have to right to intrude in the culture? And uh, you may go to some place in the world where there are people savagely living and living uh, nearly naked and you want to change all of that. Or you may go to a busy man's house. He's worked all day and knock on the door and we'll speak to him about the Lord. What right do you have to intrude into his busy schedule and to, to make some interference into his family? Well, the Lord Jesus said, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. He puts the great personal emphasis on this passage. Ye, ye, you have authority? Is it a biblical authority? Settle that in your heart. You're doing what God has given you to do. Not as a preacher, a missionary, an evangelist, but as a Christian. Every Christian should be a witness. Every Christian should be a worker. Right? Every Christian should know the word. 
biblical authority. We have it. The Lord's commanded it. We're his children. He's given us his work to do. Think of that. He's entrusted us with his work to do. Notice the third thing, if you'll write it down, please. We must have biblical power. You shall receive power. The Lord brings us to our inability and his ability. Those things go hand in hand. I can be strongest in my greatest weakness. When Paul wrote about God's dealing with him with a thorn in the flesh, he said, when I'm weak, then, at that moment, I'm strong. I was in a hospital visiting yesterday and seeing a 99-year-old lady who's precious to us. She's ready for heaven. Her family was gathered around her, and I prayed with her, talked to her, tried to encourage the family, and I said to the family, she's 99 years old, and what we see is not what's really going on. She looks weak and frail and face bruised and has some bodily injuries, very weak, but inside there's a young girl bouncing up and down, shouting in her soul, I'm going to be with Jesus. We don't see that. And we need the strength comes and the power that comes from God to do his work. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Oh, may God help us. It's a, it's a difficult thing to get to that then, that weakness. Some of it you've experienced. I remember when I was living alone, my mother, I adored my mother, 700 miles away, my brother with my mother, my two sisters with my mother, and I stayed in Tennessee to finish the last year in high school. God used that in my life. That was the, that was the year the Lord really got a hold of me in a big way. But he used that loneliness and weakness. Some of you get into a dorm and get away from families and familiar surroundings and friends and you think this is awful, but it's not awful because while you're dealing with one thing, God's dealing with another thing. Look for Jesus standing behind there. I hate to say it this way. A song says it this way. I don't really like to think of it this way, but he's standing there in the shadows. And you'll meet him. You need his strength, his power. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed with opportunity. I'm overwhelmed with responsibility. I'm overwhelmed with duty. I think at times, though we should learn to rest in the way, not just take periods of rest, resting in the way, I think, how can I do this? And then other things are coming to me to do. We are working. God is working. We're laboring together. The Lord is showing me my inability and his ability. God help us. His power. His power. And by the way, that's not uh, one infusion of power like you might imagine. Yes, we can be filled with the Spirit and we should live a Spirit-filled life. We can be anointed of God for certain tasks when dwelt by the Holy Spirit now. I believe I'm the only man in the world that has the anointing to be the pastor of this church because of what God gave me to do and he equips me to do it. But when I'm no longer here and he wants someone else here, that man will know and he'll be able to say exactly what I just said to you, that God equips us with his spirit to do his work. I believe we're baptized in the body of Christ when we come to know the Lord as our Savior. He's in us, we're in him. If you put a water in a, a sponge in a bucket of water, you may ask, is the water in the sponge or the sponge in the water? And you say, both. I am in the Lord and the Lord is in me. You see? But receiving power and the Spirit of God came on the day of Pentecost to empower these believers for his work. Do you have God's power? Dr. Lee Robertson was walking across a campground one day after speaking on the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit and one of the young people at the camp walked right up to him, stopped him 
and looked him in the face and said, you just spoke of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's power, the Holy Spirit's feeling, feeling, filling, F-I-L-L-I-N-G, filling. And he said, are you filled with God's Spirit at this moment? He said, I never got over that question. Are you filled with God's Spirit at this moment? I don't need to try to do what I'm doing today without depending on the Lord. I want you to write down a fourth thing too. <coughs> Not only biblical power, but we must have a biblical witness. I said I've written on these things already. They're in print. You can get them. What is a biblical witness? It's someone who's experienced God for himself or herself. Salvation is instantaneous. To say once and for all and forever. No doubt about that. One of my spiritual fathers used to say it's full, it's free, it's forever. Salvation. We are saved from the penalty of sin. Christ took our penalty. He appeared on the cross to do that. He died, was buried and rose from the dead. But we're also saved from the power of sin. We can have victory no matter how great the temptation by depending on the Lord. He appears in heaven for that, ever living to make intercession for us. We're also saved and shall be saved from the very presence of sin. We're already seated with the Lord in heaven, our risen Savior, but we're saved from the presence of sin. He will appear in the clouds for us someday. We'll be caught up to be with him. to save us from the very presence of sin. We have salvation. Are you a witness? In Luke chapter 24, he said to his disciples, ye are witnesses of these things. Now you're gonna be endued with power, but you're a witness. It behooved Christ to suffer, and you're a witness of this. Are you a witness of his salvation? We must have a biblical witness. Then why don't we do more of it? Terribly tragic thing took place on the highway not far from here just days ago. Some senior citizens returning from a Christian meeting had a blowout on the tire, the bus they were on they're from Statesville, North Carolina. Eight of them killed, I understand. Eight people killed, many injured. The driver killed, they crashed into. Another passenger in a car killed. The highway patrol was to investigate. There was some confusion because the government's had a shutdown. That's a political thing. But they were trying to find people who saw the accident, who witnessed what happened. And they sought to find people who were witnesses of what happened. We understand that, don't we? The Lord Jesus says, you are a witness. You know it's happened in your life. You're a witness. If we're going to get God's work done, there must be a biblical witness who has experienced salvation for himself or herself. Right? I want you to write down another thing, please. There must be a biblical motive. You should be witnesses unto me. Unto me. A biblical motive. Why are we in this? You care more about his name than you do your name? Do I? Do I? I, I think there's no telling how far God will take us and bless us and use us if we want to magnify his name. But we'll live and die under a bushel if we're just living for our name even though there might be some short-lived fame, it'll be soon forgotten because in his presence no flesh will glory. Do you have a biblical motive? Christ, Christ seen, 
Christ in you, our identity with him. I was in a place yesterday, a young man, I've followed his life from early, early childhood. He had, uh, he had marked up his body since I saw him last. I love him. He can be painted green, I still love him. He can do something outlandish and ridiculous, I still love him. But when I came into his presence, he tried to hide what he had done. And I said to him, as I called his name, I've already seen your arm. Now, why did he hide that from me? He crossed some barrier in his own mind to get it done. Why did he hide it from me? I don't think he hid it from me. I think when he saw me, he thought of pastor, Lord, responsibility. And by the way, it was some sort of Christian looking thing, you know, which someone may have talked him into. Those kind of markings have to do with ownership. And my body is not my own. It's the Lord's. And I'd have to get permission from him to do anything to it or with it. That's what the Bible says. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We'll deal with that some other day. <laughs> Motive. And then we come to the thing that people start with. Would you write it down? There must be a biblical strategy. Now, you jump right in the fight and say, I've got a strategy. This is what we're going to do. We've come to a strategy. But if we don't have the other things preceding the strategy, the strategy is to no avail. The Lord said Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the most parts of the earth. I want you to meditate upon what is Jerusalem. What is your Jerusalem? In our Lord's day, Jerusalem, well-defined city, area there of Jerusalem. Judea, Jerusalem was in Judea. Samaria, Samaria, north of Judea, between Judea and the Galilee, those three regions, Judea, Samaria, the Galilee. When Herod the Great died, if I remember correctly, this whole biblical geography thing, his son Archelaus took, took control and he fouled out and Rome removed him and then that area of Palestine was divided into three parts and Herod's three sons were over a part. But the Lord said, Samaria, misplaced, displaced, despised people. We have places like that and people groups like that. Uttermost parts of the earth, the strategy. God help us. But if we don't get the biblical beginning and move right up the line to the biblical authority and the biblical power and the biblical witness and the biblical motive, if we just jump right in with a strategy, the Lord's not going to bless that. How many of you understand what I just said? And let's ask the Lord to help us.